Good morning, everyone. I'm Amy Stoles. I direct the Literary Arts Program at the National Endowment for the Arts, also referred to as the NEA. Oh, I like those little woohoos. <laughs> the NEA is a proud sponsor of the National Book Festival, in particular this very stage. And we're so thrilled that you're here at the at the understanding stage. And also a huge welcome to all of our viewers online and around the world. We're glad you're with us. So we've had a long, the NEA has had a long history of supporting our national literary arts going back to 1965. We do this in a lot of ways. We offer creative writing fellowships to individual poetry and prose writers, and you'll see several of them on this stage today. We give translation fellowships, which give literary translators the time and space to create English translations um, and renditions of the world's best literature. We give grants to organizations like independent publishers, presenters, festivals like this around the country, and large national initiatives like Poetry Out Loud, which is a poetry recitation competition for high school students, and the NEA Big Read, which supports community reading and writing programs in towns and cities across the country. So if you want to find out more about anything I just mentioned, you can stop by our table right there in the back. We have our NEA staff roaming around, and they're happy to answer your questions. And by the way, if you see a Library of Congress survey taker roaming around the festival, please take their survey. We're all very interested in hearing from you and incorporating your thoughts to know what to do for future book festivals. So you are here, you're in for a treat here at the Understanding Stage. We've got murder and mayhem and monsters and secrets and visceral truths and talking animals. We kick off our amazing lineup today with our first event titled Body Count, talking about crime in our age of reckoning, featuring two fabulous writers, Rebecca Mackay and Sarah Weinman. Rebecca is one of our NEA Creative Writing Fellows and the author of the best-selling novel, The Great Believers, which was a finalist for both the Pulitzer Prize and the National Book Award, and a recipient of the Andrew Carnegie Mellet Medal, the Stonewall Book Award, and Clark Prize and the Los Angeles Times Book Prize. Today, she'll be talking about her new novel, I Have Some Questions For You. And joining her is Sarah Weinman, author of Scoundrel and the Real Lolita. She was a 2020 National Magazine Award finalist for reporting and a Calderwood Journalism Fellow, and her work has appeared in New York Magazine, The Wall Street Journal, Vanity Fair, and The Washington Post. Sarah will be talking about the new anthology she edited titled Evidence of Things Seen, True Crime in an Era of Reckoning. And I also want to welcome their moderator, Angie Kim, author of the riveting international bestseller and critically acclaimed novel Miracle Creek, and her new novel, Happiness, Happiness Falls, which is due out August 29th. Woo! <laughs> As many of us chomping at the bit. So I hope you have a great day at the festival and thank you for joining the NEA and um, as we launch the Understanding Stage. And with that, let's welcome our three authors on stage. Thank you so much, Amy, for that warm introduction. You actually did half of my job for me, so I'm really thrilled. And, um, and thank you to everyone for being here today at the first panel, and of course, our amazing authors. I just wanted to brag about you guys a little bit and fangirl here um, now that I have you on stage, um, both of you. Rebecca, um, I have some questions for you. It's gotten raves in everything from the New York Times to the New Yorker to NPR, The Atlantic, The Washington Post, starred reviews everywhere, and it was an instant New York Times bestseller. Um, I'm so thrilled. Um, and Sarah, AKA the crime lady, um, based on a long running weekly newsletter of that name. Um, I love what Chicago Tribune said about evidence of things unseen, which a uh, thing seen, sorry. And oh no, we'll going, get to the- We're uh, getting to the James Baldwin. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, Chicago Tribune said, editor Sarah Weinman has become a seal of excellence for true crime. So I love that. All right, so I want to start off by asking you both to tell us about your books um, for those in the audience that don't, that haven't read it yet. 
Oh, um, do, would you like to go first? I, I will yeah. go first. Yeah. Evidence of Things Seen is an anthology of recent true crime writing, and it is both a follow-up but also separate from an earlier anthology that I edited called Unspeakable Acts. That earlier anthology, which came out in the summer of 2020, which was a very interesting time for us all, <laughs> uh, it asked the central question, what and how has true crime evolved and changed, especially since the fall of 2014, when the first season of a podcast called Serial became a huge cultural and frankly worldwide phenomenon and introduced a lot of people who might never be interested in true crime to this type of genre. And so it really exploded this idea of who is consuming true crime, what the genre is, and how it has changed. And so because that anthology came out and showcased really great writing in this space, after I was finished with my last nonfiction book, Scoundrel, which came out in 2022, I had some time to think about what a follow-up anthology would look like. And so the working idea that I had was, what does true crime look like after we have essentially endured the worst of a pandemic, that we've seen many social justice pro protests, and then as I got to the end stage, what true crime looks like as so many rights are under threat or rolled back entirely. And so I wanted to put together an anthology that really addressed systemic issues and looked at the larger picture and a much broader scope than I think a lot of people who think about true crime had been thinking in this particular way. So that's sort of the underlying thematic idea of this anthology. I should also bring up the title, which is Evidence of Things Seen. It is a direct callback to a 1985 book by the great author and frankly one of my favorites, James Baldwin. He had gone on assignment to report and sort of look into the Atlanta child murders, which took place from about 1979 to 1981. And the way that he wrote about what was ailing Atlanta and underlying racism and just failures of the criminal justice system and policing, it was greeted with a lot of bafflement at the time of its publication, but over time I think that book, The Evidence of Things Not Seen, has really become a landmark in terms of how crime writing and thinking about crime can really work in book format. So I wanted this anthology to be in conversation with Baldwin, which is a tall order, but I, yeah. I hope that that's what I've tried to do. I love that. Um, Rebecca, would you like to tell yeah. us about your, oh, yeah. I have some questions for you. We both have long titles. <laughs> we both have yes, we do. Yeah. 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 There's this thing when you're talking about your book that they, you're kind of supposed to say the name of your book as often as you can so people remember it. Yeah. When you have a really long book title, that becomes a kind of obnoxious. <laughs> well, at <laughs> least like evidence but of like, things seen is only for words. Yeah, it's mine just, is longer but, than yours. I right, have but also yeah. with nonfiction, you get into the subtitle problem. Oh God, yeah. Yes. yes. <laughs> We were talking about this last night, and yeah. I was like, I'm not going to say both of your, you know, it's including the <laughs> subtitles, because it's just going to take up the entire time. Yeah. Anyway, I have um, some questions, have some questions for, you. for you. Is a novel. Um, so it's funny, I'm up here, you know, talking about true crime. My book is, by definition, fictional crime, but it takes true crime and the true crime sort of ecosystem, the true crime industrial complex, <laughs> as one of its subjects. Yeah. So the story is, uh, we have a, a woman in her 40s, her name is Bodie Kane. She is a successful film historian living in LA. She's invited back uh, in 2018, in the dead of winter, to teach for two weeks at the boarding school in New Hampshire that she had attended as a sort of adrift scholarship student in the 90s. She's coming back to teach a course on film history, and because she has a podcast on film history, she's also teaching a class on podcasting. When she's back on campus, her mind is of course back on the 1990s, her adolescence. Um, she's thinking back on things through a new lens in the same way, especially with Me Too, that a lot of us looked back on our own high school, our own college, different experience, uh, with, a, you know, with different vision on our experiences. Um, while she's there, 
one of the things she's thinking about quite naturally is the death in her senior year of a classmate named Thalia Keith. Thalia was not friends with Bodhi, but they'd been assigned as roommates the year before, and Thalia was found dead in the campus swimming pool with significant injuries to her body. And very quickly, a young black man who works at the school as an athletic trainer is convicted with what seems like a mountain of evidence against him, including DNA and a confession. Um, he has been in prison ever since, and while many people consider the case absolutely closed, there is a growing online community of people who believe that Omar Evans, the man in prison, is innocent. One of Bodhi's podcast students is among them, and she decides she wants to do her podcast on this case and what she believes to be the wrongful conviction of Omar Evans. Uh, Bodhi initially wants nothing to do with this for a number of reasons, but quickly gets drawn in, and the book goes from there. Yeah. Um, so since we have a nonfiction and a fiction, and we have sort of this Venn diagram of both of your books in conversation with each other, I thought it might be interesting to talk about Sarah, your op-ed in the New York Times this past spring. And you were talking about an error, a factual error that um, was in the Boston Strangler case, and you said, you know, errors like that threaten the integrity of true crime, which as a genre has grappled with whether the stories it tells about crimes are in fact true. And, then, and you say true crime has always had a volatile relationship with facts, which is fascinating because if you're making stuff up, you're just writing a crime novel, a mystery, or you know, a thriller, which has always been a very, very popular genre. And so I just wanted to talk about what makes true crime its own genre, especially these days when it has kind of become a term of art. Um, and yeah, so can you, can you take us through that a little bit? Well, I like to say that true crime has been having a moment for several hundred years. Yeah, exactly. You go back to <laughs> the Salem witch trials and when Cotton Mather was going around with pamphlets and castigating these horrible women for being witches, which is, of course, I mean, that may have been one of the earlier wrongful convictions also. Yeah. Just the fact that they made up a crime and then executed these poor women for it. But society in general, but I think it, particularly American society has had this long time fasc fascination with crime. I mean, and every time there is some kind of new development in technology, it seems as if there's a major true crime case or a criminal trial that accompanies it. So industrial revolution, the invention of the radio, I mean, that was an invention of film, invention of television, podcasts, every time there are books. But at the same time, and this is because I've also cut my teeth not just as a crime writer in the nonfiction space, but also that crime fiction is my first and best love, and I now review crime novels for the New York Times. So I'm seeing, I've always been seeing fiction and nonfiction as linked together, but for so long people would separate and go, well, I only read mysteries, I don't want to read true crime, or I only read nonfiction, I don't want to read mysteries and fiction. But the relationship between crime fiction and true crime also is a really long one. If you go back about 100 years, most of the major mystery writers, people like Agatha Christie and Dorothy L. Sayers, they were obsessed with true crime. They yeah. constantly wrote about poisonings. There's one case, I think, the Edith Thompson case of a woman who probably poisoned her husband, but there's some issue about it. And this, for whatever reason, just really captured the fancy of these particular crime writers. There were anthologies related to it. And then it kind of just fell away and they sort of separated out. But to bring it back to the idea that I was writing about in this op-ed, I came up, I was thinking about this also because I had been marinating a lot in Truman Capote's work. Earlier this year I wrote a piece about Capote's crime journalism and work in the aftermath of In Cold Blood which on the one hand is a really formative text if you want to be working and frankly consuming true crime. But there's no getting around that in order for him to make the leap from writing and reporting and befriending the killers of the Clutter family, that he made up significant portions of the book, especially the ending, which is yeah. just, you know, 
Yeah. He just came up with it out of wholesale cloth and did not happen. <laughs> and fabulism was something that Capote struggled with for a lot of his later career, especially as he devolved into drugs and alcohol and risky behavior and frankly, I think undiagnosed PTSD going back to his childhood and also like if you spend a lot of time visiting people on death row, it's gonna do something to you. That's just a given. And then to become, as he did, a go-to for criminal justice, it just was wild. So these were all of the things that I was thinking about. And then I watched this movie, which is a fictional movie, and as a result, I have a lot of latitude for what you can make up. But if you get a basic thing wrong, like so representing that somebody is alive when in fact they are not, it makes me question, what else are you getting wrong? And so these are the things that true crime as a genre has to grapple with, which is what's more important, the people and the facts or the story that you want to tell that overrides any concern, for, especially for other people's trauma and pain? So that's a, a long-winded yeah. answer to your question. Yeah, and also, you know, what distinguishes it from investigative journalism, where, you know, just by virtue of calling it true crime, it doesn't have that imprimatur of you know, fact-checking and things like that. Rebecca, your novel, um, and you and I have had conversations, many conversations about your wonderful novel, and we have talked about how your novel, even though it's a fictional case, there is a lot of um, real-world implications and a lot of real-world things that you are pulling in there. And that's one of the things that haunted me about some of the things that you um, had in your novel. And so I just took the liberty of pulling up a passage and wondered if you yeah. might be, sorry, we are doing this the old-fashioned, uh, no, the new-fashioned way. Um, it's at the bottom. So if you want to maybe yeah. to, uh, read a little bit of that just to yeah. give us a flavor for the amazing voice of the novel, and then we can talk a little more about that too. Yeah, yeah. what's happening here is that we're, uh, you know, Bodhi is back on this campus, and there's a story on the news that her, she doesn't know what it is, and her husband keeps saying, don't check Twitter. Um, and she decides to, to turn on the TV. And there it was, the reason Jerome had warned me off the internet, Anderson Cooper with new developments on a story I had found particularly disturbing. It doesn't matter which story. Let's say it was the one where the young actresses said yes to a pool party and didn't know. Or no, let's say it was the one where the rugby team covered up the girl's death and the school covered for the rugby team. Actually, it was the one where the therapist spent years grooming her. It was the one where the senator, then a promising teenager, shoved his dick in the girl's face. She was also a promising teenager. It was the one where the billionaire shoved the woman into the phone booth, but no one believed her. The one where the high school senior was acquitted of rape because the sophomore girl had shaved her pubic region, which somehow equaled consent. Oliver asked if I was hungry, and I shrugged. It's the guy she's staying there with. It was the one where the woman who stabbed her rapist with scissors was the one who ended up in jail. It was the one where the star had a secret button to lock the doors. It was the one where the harasser ended up on the Supreme Court. It was the one where the rapist ended up on the Supreme Court. It was the one where the woman shaking testified all day on live TV and nothing happened. It's like that. Yeah. Yeah, and I think it's really especially appropriate that you know we're on the understanding stage, um, mm -hmm. you know, sponsored by the NEA, because one of the things that I think you both do and try to do is explore the ways in which race, gender, socioeconomic class um, all play a role in how the police, the media, and the community at large, especially in yours, Rebecca, you know, views crimes and the assumptions that we make about the perpetrators and the victims. Mm -hmm. um, so, and you, and sort of looking at it through that feminist lens also, and, you know, interrogating the ways that we're sort of addressing all of these crimes and the kind of lurid de details. Mm -hmm. So can you talk a little bit about that? And was that an intent of yours? Yeah, it became one. Um, you know, I, I I'm someone, I never sit down to write a novel thinking first about themes or broader implications. I just start with story. And, you know, what if, you know, I, there were several different origin points, but one of them was just, 
this girl dead in the pool and what happened and, and a mystery. Um, and also about someone, you know, the boarding school environment, someone revisiting their past. Um, but then out of that grow these things. Um, one of the things that happened for me is you make a different commitment to realism with every project of fiction. Um, I could decide, for instance, only to write about real people and real events, but still make it fiction. Or I could set things in an imagined town or an imagined world. In this case, although these events are made up and the school is made up, I decided that I wanted realism on the levels of criminal justice, the carceral system, the way investigations work, the way that the attention, the public attention of a case like this would affect the investigation and the people in it. Um, I didn't want this, in other words, to kind of exist in book world. I wanted it to feel like the real world. And it's funny too because, you know, there are certain genres that are only a genre, like a zombie novel is only a genre. That's not a real <laughs> thing, right? Versus like, say, a love story. Well, there's a romance novel genre, but also love exists yeah. in real life, and you could have a serious novel that's a love story that's not a romance novel. Murder is another one of those things. You could have a genre detective novel, but murders happen in real life, and in real life we need to look back and say, wait, what happened here in the past? What do we know, what do we not know, what are we assuming, and what might we have gotten wrong? And what are the real world implications of that? Um, wrongful incarceration is the ugly underbelly of so much of the true crime stories that we consume. So that, all that stuff, as I, as I took a realist lens to that subject matter, it had to become about wrongful incarceration and the public eye and the way that there are certain stories that we feel ownership over. Yeah. You know, I feel like everyone has some kind of true crime story that they almost feel like is theirs, not because it happened to you, but it happened in your town or you know that person or you just latched onto it for some reason. Mm -hmm. um, it's the one you think about. Yeah. And there, that's a strange relationship that we have, right? Um, so those things, you know, because of that realist lens, they had to come in there um, and they became broadly thematic. Yeah. Um, and it was, it was something I wanted to explore. You know, I approach subject matter not because I have something to say, but because I have a lot of questions about yeah. it. Um, and confusion over, you know, why am I drawn to this? Why yeah. are we drawn to this? Absolutely. I feel like as writers, we sometimes write about things in order to make sense of them because, right. because we don't know yeah. um, what to think about something. Sarah, what about you? I mean, so much of, this, you have 14 essays that you have pulled and the 14 essays that you have curated, they really do reflect some of these challenges that we were talking about, those, the social factors, the race, gender, all of that. Is that something that you went into this project thinking I'm going to look for articles and you know, essays and stories that really have that theme or is that something that merged out of the reading and the calling process? It was a little bit of both. So w one thing that regrettably I noticed and came up when Unspeakable Acts, the earlier anthology published, is that there was only one contribution by a writer of color. And that reflected what my friend Elon Green wrote as, as a piece called The Pernicious Whiteness of True Crime. Yeah. And it's that this genre has always privileged and prioritized dead white girls and the investigation thereof. And doing so is so it's so limiting yeah. and it just devalues every other type of crime and frankly every t other type of person who might either be a victim of a crime or a perpetrator or in a community. And so I was really hoping with this anthology to, exp to broaden that to some degree. And so as a result, just like with the earlier one, I was creating this master list of pieces that I thought really were standouts, and when I say standouts, it's that they were wonderfully written, well-reported, but also had some larger thing to say. But I also was looking for particular themes. So the first piece in Evidence of Things Seen is an essay by Wes Lowry, who was with the Washington Post, and now he's written for a, a number of other publications, 
he had published this story in GQ about essentially a lynching that had happened in the 1980s, which is not something we would normally think of happening as recently as that decade, but it also is indicative of so many of the lingering and outstanding problems in terms of who gets justice and who doesn't, who we, who people want to inflict essentially vigilantism on, who doesn't, and how this problem of racism, much as we would like to pretend it's, it could go away, it clearly will, will not be. I also wanted to include a piece about missing and murdered indigenous white women, and, uh, uh, indigenous women and girls, and doing so required me to uh, search out writers who were operating this space and who really were reporting on the communities in which they were from. I thought a lot about Connie Walker, who is a wonderful podcaster. She's won a Peabody Award. I think she's won a Pulitzer now. Uh, she had done a podcast called Missing and Murdered. She had also done a, a couple of series about, called Stolen about missing and murdered girls. And then I, f I discovered this writer, Brandy Morin, who's also Canadian and also operating this space, and she wrote this piece for National Geographic about communities in Northern California. And I thought, well, I haven't heard enough about this. That's on me. I should be searching this out some more. And when I read the piece, I knew I wanted to include it. But I also wanted to talk about subjects that we might not think of in terms of true crime or think enough of restorative justice, white collar crime, white -collar and crime, also yeah. how to interrogate the genre itself, which is a subject that I'm personally fascinated in yeah. and always will be. Yeah. But I also wanted to search out other people who are operating the same space. Yeah, and one of the things that you, know, you point out, I think in your introduction, is talking about sort of looking at the victims and true crime, you know, shining more of a lens for good or bad on the victims, and you guys both you know, uh, explore that idea, um, Rebecca, in your novel, there is a focus, an uncomfortable one sometimes, on the victim herself, right. who is, who does fall into this trope right. of the beautiful, you know, right. <laughs> white woman, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, so talk a little bit about that. And also, we were talking about this last night, and I kind of, you know, sort of pulled these ladies aside, and I said, you know, can I ask you about the fact on stage that you're both white women and we are talking no about <laughs> you know race yeah. and so I wanted to ask you guys about that too and how sort of that plays into sort of interrogating this whole women and girls in peril right. type of trope that is very prevalent and that we all sort of kind of bemoan from time to time and yet your you know your victim in your novel is a white woman i think you're trying to shine a lens onto right. that so yeah right. it's not accidental right no of right. course um, absolutely yeah i mean part of the project of the book was to say let's look at the exact kind of case that would be clickbait right there are all these factors including wealth including youth including um, perceived, you know, physical beauty, all, you know, uh, being a young woman, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, um, that, you know, it's the perfect storm yeah. of the case that does go viral. And on the one hand, you could say, well, that's, you know, that's a privilege, right, that these cases get the attention. On the other hand, it's a really, really creepy kind of attention, and the fetishization of someone being dead is that, you know, like, is that anything anyone wants? Um, so it, it, I don't have any answers on that at all, to be clear. Um, but that was, you know, the project of the book. There's a lot of discussion then within the book about mm -hmm. what it means for this particular case to be that topic, and there's, um, I have in the book because there's a younger generation of students that Bodhi, my protagonist, is working with. Um, these students are very who are, much who asking, are podcasters. They're about, yeah, <laughs> young podcasters. They're very much asking these questions and almost talking themselves out of getting involved. When meanwhile there is this man languishing in prison who would not care who is helping him yeah. um, and, and or why or you know. So it's. Um, it's something, you know, the, the questions that those kids have in the book are questions I have, too. The questions the books, book asks are questions I'm asking, too. Um, it's something, you know, 
we have, um, we have for whatever reason a cultural obsession with it, one thing we need to do is to back off from that, look elsewhere, get over it, do other things. But one thing that oddly I think helps in doing that is to examine what we are doing and why. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do in the book. Did it feel at all, um, did you question whether you were, um, as a white woman, whether you like sort of had the right, you know, quote unquote, to think about these issues, of course, to think about these issues, but right. to write about it and to right. really, you know, shine a light onto it? Yeah, I mean, yeah. you always worry. Uh, you always, you know, you're sitting there writing and at some point the worst case scenario comes into right. your head and you start to like hear your own snarky Goodreads reviews that no one's actually written exactly. yet. Exactly. <laughs> Where someone's like, who does she think she is? Um, uh, but here's the thing. I really believe as an author that writing about race and examining race is not something that white writers can wash their hands of. Right. And say that belongs to writers of color. I'm going to write about other stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's we a reason be... why Claudia Rankin's project is about whiteness right now. Right, right. Because yeah. we are all complicit and we're all responsible. Right. And we all have to be part of this larger project. And to just yeah. fluff it off to people of color is yeah. impressive. Right, right. And so I do think that, you know, not maybe in every book all the time, but one thing I need to do as a writer is to, as, as I think about societies, I think about now, as I think about my place in the world, I should be examining whiteness. Yeah. And that's one thing the book does. Absolutely. Okay. You have, have, I mean, so many of the pieces yeah. that you, you know, pulled out deal with this issue. So, yeah, I'd love to hear well, your take on it, too. In a way, it makes more sense for me to examine a lot of these issues as an editor yeah. because it's also my responsibility working in the crime writing space to be aware of who also is working and doing incredible exemplary work mm -hmm. and to just limit it to white writers writing about crimes involving white people is a real disservice mm -hmm. because it's not reflective of society at all. It's not reflective of who we are and what we're doing here. So it means that I, as an editor, have to work a lot harder and I think that's good. I think we all should be working harder, frankly, yeah. because to be comfortable, especially writing about crime, is is just anathema. That yeah. I've always ha made it a point in the work that I do as a writer and as an editor to try to live in the discomfort. Now that said, there are pieces or there are stories that I know that I would not do, or I would not work on as well. I don't think I'd want to overshadow somebody who is in the community in which they are writing about because they will have particular insights and perspectives and viewpoints and frankly access to sources that I as a parachuting white lady will never have that. Right. And I think that's correct. Yeah. I think having hubris in any space, but especially as a reporter and as a writer is a really great way to create tunnel vision and oh, put yeah. blinders yeah. on. Yeah. But when you were putting the anthology together, did you were you conscious of not only the issues that the you know essays addressed, but also the identity of the writers and you know whether they did have were they actually writing about spaces that they were personally familiar or culturally familiar with, that kind of thing? I'm just curious about that from an editor's you know, curator's perspective too. I wouldn't say that it was necessarily a one-to-one -one yeah. ratio, but these yeah. were all sort of marinating in my mind as I, was, as, as I was ultimately trying to put together the best anthology of the best writing about crime in all of its permutations and combinations. And I should also say that when I think about true crime as a genre, that I try to take the most expansive and the broadest possible definition because I think that for so long this genre has been pretty limited and as a result, I think we've been missing out on a lot of excellent writing and excellent just media yeah. to that point. Yeah. I also wanted to follow up a little bit about what you were saying because one of the other cases that has really kind of captured especially American attention is what's happened in Moscow, Idaho 
And it has become not just about you know, young, white men and women who were savagely murdered, but the media response and the fact that this particular true crime moment that we're still in has really been like the one thing that I think distinguishes that this moment from earlier moments is that it's much more participatory. It's much more about getting online and feeling like you yeah. yourself yeah. could help solve this crime because right. cops are incompetent or yeah. you just don't think that they're doing the job right and you think that you can do better yeah. and feeling like you're not just passively consuming but actively being involved. Yeah, yeah. well, and this, this is something, I mean, one thing that I'm dealing with in my book is, is both sides of that, right? There are people who, in my novel, are creepily getting involved online. I have mm -hmm. like a really creepy YouTuber yeah. in there. Mm -hmm. um, and people who are messing things up. But there is also this work being done for the Innocence Project side of yes, things and absolutely. awareness. And so, like, you know, this is within that true crime yeah. world. There are both sides of those things. We have cold cases being reopened or Jane Doe's being identified, people coming forward, um, but also people completely coming in and mucking up crime scenes at the same time. Yeah. Both of those things are true. Um, and it is, you know, like you're saying, the interest in true crime is it probably, you know, as old as humans, yeah. but um, this idea that, you know, you can be an armchair detective from yeah. anywhere, uh, that is a little bit new. And it's, Absolutely. It's and I was thinking about that too, is that um, sort of at the risk of being kind of oxymoronic, the true crime fiction <laughs> realm, yeah, yeah, right? Which yeah. is where I would put your, uh, how I would categorize, you know, y your book in, in one sense. Um, it is kind of dealing with the fact that, you know, in the, the older mysteries, like sort of relied on the, you know, cool detective, the PI, you know, that type of thing. And now it's not just an amateur sleuth, yeah. but it's really the community coming together yeah. and sort of working together in ways to try to sort of piece all of these things together, which frankly we didn't have before because we yeah. didn't have like the access to each other, right. you know, except as, neighbors or whatever, but now we have all of these, you know, things like in, um, some of the essays that you, taught, you pulled out and in your novel, there are people coming together and from all over the globe who are like commenting and who are like pouring over thousands of pages yeah. of documents. It's yeah. really scary, well, it's, but also fascinating. Yeah, and, and sometimes <laughs> helpful, sometimes yeah. really helpful. Very. The, it's, it's funny too, because you think like, right, you don't have to invent like a Miss Marple who happens to always be there when the murders happen anymore. Yeah. You can have a very realistic citizen yes. detective yeah. in a way that didn't make sense until quite recently. Yeah, yes. no, this kind of hive mind, which is yeah. very, very yeah. cool. Yeah, I mean, is that how you see the sort of true crime genre going, Sarah? Like, as far as um, using the technology, I can sort of see somebody making a cool portal that is specifically for this that, you know, really that allows uh, police or somebody like that to sort of make advan take advantage of and sort of having an uber uh, kind of oversight over things. And just because the true crime um, arena, especially as of late and as you talk about in the future, are sort of going toward really questioning sort of the police and mm -hmm. not relying so much on what they tell us and what the community tells us and what the prosecutor tells us. I think the other great development of this true crime moment has been investigative genetic genealogy oh, and the yeah. fact yeah. that yeah. it really grew out of citizen yeah, detective like work. That. Yeah. Now it has become much more professionalized and I think that has to be the case because as more private laboratories and law enforcement get involved and try to not just clear their backlog of cold cases but they're now using IgG to work on active cases. But in doing so, it's also highlighting, to my mind, a lot of the problems that happen in, investi in police investigations, which involve cops who get tunnel vision or are lazy or they can't figure out what kind of evidence they have in place uh, with respect to the suspect who was just arrested for the Long Island serial murder case, or at least in 
uh, three of them and probably a fourth soon. That was evidence that the police knew about going back to 2010 and it was just sitting in the files. Yeah. And because of just constant incompetence and corruption, it just got buried and buried and buried and then it took another task force and additional technology work with cell phones and I believe, uh, maybe not in IgG, but other types of touch D familial DNA work. That's a case where it probably should have been solved years ago, but yes, maybe t new technological innovations helped you know, move the football forward a little bit. But I've seen so many news stories of cold cases that are cleared with IgG, and the underlying subtext is the cops could have had it right, but they just either didn't know what they were doing or just went along the wrong investigative yeah. road. But then to also go back to thinking about the participatory element, and I'll bring up the Idaho murders again, there was this piece that McKay Coppins wrote about in The Atlantic earlier this year where he went to the town and nobody would talk to him because they had all been traumatized by all of these amateur sleuths and also yeah. just the relentless media coverage of this case that it hadn't quite out and out destroyed the entire town, but it had, it had permanently changed them. Yeah. And the fact that there are at least three book projects that I know about, I just got a text message from a producer friend last night who's working on a documentary about this. Oh, it's just, wow. it, there are certain crimes that because they are clickbaity, because they have certain tropes that take away from the actual humanity of the people involved and turn them into, you know, just... right puppet figures or whatever, cutouts, that somehow that gets not just one type of media, but the, all this like overlapping. So it's like a book becomes a podcast, becomes mm -hmm. a TV show, becomes yeah. a documentary, becomes a film, becomes all sorts of mm -hmm. types of media we haven't maybe invented yet. And so in doing so, it's like, well, what are we even doing here? There's so many other stories and so many other cases and so many other people who deserve our attention and time, and they're not getting it because we're gonna have the 12th documentary about Ted Bundy? Like, what, what are yeah. we doing here? Yeah, 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 no, definitely. Mm -hmm. um, so I wanted to um, invite the audience, um, I have a couple more questions that I'll get to, but I just wanted to prepare the audience members that if you wanna start thinking about questions and lining up, um, we'd love to um, get some questions for, um, for these wonderful authors. Okay, so, my questions, I still have some, um, are quality of the writing at the sentence level. I just wanted to talk about that because that's something that we haven't really addressed because we've been talking about the substance of you know this fascinating question. Um, but I just, Rebecca, the gorgeous, intimate, first person, person voice that's addressing the you, um, these haunting rifts on the Me Too cases, Sarah, the stories that you curated are not just kind of riveting, shocking cases um, substantively, but also just beautifully written. Um, how important is that? Have you thought about sort of what your, um, uh, you know, the plot line or the story is, and Sarah, what the substance of what you're trying to sort of say through this anth anthology but also really paying attention to that sort of sentence level kind of, you know, craft. Yeah, yeah, it, you know, it, it's a constant feeding, I think, back and forth between, uh, you know, content and, and tone, where, um, you know, I, I'm not gonna worry too much about my sentences early on, like you don't polish the statue while you're still carving it, like, yeah, yeah. wait, right? Um, but then, Sometimes just, you know, the way I write something, um, the, the second person, which we, it, the, I have some questions for you, the, the you is someone who's being addressed in the book. That, you know, the first time that person was addressed was just something that kind of came out as I was writing um, on this, and then I went, okay, I can work with this. Let's see what I can do with this, and it became very much a part of the subject of the book. Yeah. It's back and forth and back and forth, and then of course, we all know as writers, like the last, six months of editing are all yeah. just scalpel work yeah. on, the, on the line, yeah. they have to be. Yeah. I mean, it's also, when I'm writing my own work, I think a lot about yeah, voice course. and tone yeah. and syntax and subject all, not necessarily in this very clear-minded way, it, it can be pretty amorphous 
but it's all there. And as a critic, I have to trust my own instincts about what is good storytelling and what is good writing. And that's often, frankly, down to, like, I, I sort of pull the curtain pretty quickly, especially as I'm reading crime fiction, that if, if you're not grabbing me within the first page, uh, it's pretty unlikely I'm going to continue. <laughs> yeah. Because I have to read a lot of crime novels in order to figure out what's gonna make it in for the monthly column. But I'm just, I'm doing that all the time with everything yeah. I read. Yeah. And so in preparing Evidence of Things Seen, that was a consideration that I didn't just want to be thinking thematically. I was also, yeah. I also wanted to think on the sentence level of yeah. who is writing just really extraordinarily well. Yeah. So it wasn't just about good reporting, but also about the entire package. Yeah. And that's also why I wanted to have, as I did with the earlier anthology, a mix of reported features and essays and critical considerations because this genre demands that we think about it as a literary genre. Yeah, absolutely. And I love how you have at the back um, other articles that you considered that are sort of, you know, that was essentially like the best my American. master list. Right. Like that's Absolutely. what I drew. I love that. The final yeah. collection. From. It's a great resource for all of us too. Okay. So we're going to take questions. I'll go, I'll go back and forth and I'll start from that side because they have a longer line. Sorry. Yeah. Arbitrary. Awesome. Um, maybe, maybe. Oh, yeah. There, we go. there you go. Thank you very much. So, um, I had a question about availability bias and audience priming um, and sort of mm. how you think about um, who you're speaking to whenever you write about crime. Um, I'm particularly interested in how you think about priming an audience who themselves feel vulnerable, but also about how you think about priming law enforcement and fostering mm. a sort of a culture of pressure to get a good enough answer um, mm. to resolve people's sort of feelings of wanting to um, come to some kind of resolution. Mm. Um, I've done some post-conviction work and um, often, often uh, the, the issue that we face um, as folks fighting for people who are incarcerated uh, is not um, a lack of attention to their case. Often it is a feverish level of attention yeah. Yeah. Uh, that leads to law enforcement feeling a ton of pressure, especially elected prosecutors feeling a ton of pressure to come up with a solution and I don't think it's any accident that if you read um, legal writing, the bodiest, most intensely compelling narratives of crime stories are in the majority opinions written by Justice Thomas upholding murder convictions. They're in the opinions by um, the majority on the Fifth Circuit saying, you know, yeah. off with their head. Um, so I'm curious if there's a step in your process, if there's a part of your process where you think about sort of the sensation, the mm -hmm. sort of compulsion, yeah. um, and the, the availability and priming effect of, of true crime writing on, um, on multiple audiences. Okay, Thank you right. so much. Thank you. Yeah. I, no, go ahead. I, can, I mean, I'm, again, I'm not writing true crime, I'm writing fictional crime. But, <laughs> but. Um, but um, no, that, I mean, that is largely, that is one of the biggest topics of my novel, Absolutely. is the idea of railroading of suspects, wrongful incarceration, the near impossibility of getting anything even to a point of retrial, let alone an exoneration. And, uh, you know, I think of, you know, I'm writing a novel, I don't want it to be didactic, but the more I learn, the more I'm thinking, I do want this to be educational for people. Absolutely. The last thing I want to do is to write the Perry Mason version of this, where everything magically works out in the end. Um, I worked very closely with a public defender in New Hampshire, among many other people, just on what is, you know, down to the minutiae, what is legally feasible, what is legally possible, because the vast majority of stories that most of us consume regarding crime, first of all, fiction usually has a nice, neat ending on it, um, where bad people are punished and the right person is let go, and in, um, true crime, we often are seeking out stories with a tidy ending or with the hope of a tidy ending. Mm. And it's not a huge spoiler, but my book does not have a tidy ending. And that is for a very, that is for a reason. Well, you can't call a book, I have some questions for you, have a tidy ending. That right. Would actually and here is yeah. the answer. But to, but to that point, I think that this ongoing moment is more about asking questions than finding neat and tidy answers because we keep finding out just the degree of malfeasance or the degree of incompetence or the degree of ignorance or the degree of uncaring 
that the purported criminal justice system has, mm -hmm. and that it does not do anyone any favors, be it victims of crime, perpetrators, those who are wrongfully, but also rightfully incarcerated, that they're not necessarily getting the help and services that they need. Mm -hmm. So these are things that I think about, but I also just try not to think about them too didactically, right. because I'm not here to you know, be on a soapbox, even though I think my opinions come through in the work that I write and the pieces that I edit, they have a particular argument that they're trying to make. So that's going to come through. But I think just sitting with the questions and sitting with what we thought worked but clearly does not and yeah. thinking through processes that could improve on everybody's quality of life but also in terms of how we think about yeah. crime and the world that we're operating in is helpful to everyone. There are obviously people who, and particularly lawyers and judges who might not be as interested in that because they have a particular agenda that they might be furthering and working against that can be extraordinarily difficult, but the work is still really important. Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Uh, my question is specifically for Ms. Mackay. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that happens a lot, and I have some questions for you, is this, the greater examination of, you know, whose crime gets examined, the person, mm -hmm. the yeah. young, pretty enough, white enough girl. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that Bodhi kept experiencing different levels of examination of feminism or attacks on it. Right. People keep asking her who's watching her kids, mm -hmm. the whole yeah. Me Too debacle that she gets yeah. dragged into regarding her husband. And I know you said you think of story before theme first, but how early on did you think you wanted to draw in all these levels of examination yeah. of feminism and attacks yeah. on it? Yeah, thank you. I think, you know, partly that's a matter of the, the air you're breathing when you're writing, right? It's what's going on in your own life or what's going on in the world. And I started writing this book in 20, early 2019. And the Me Too thing for me and kind of a re-examination, a recasting of feminism as it pertains specifically to the self um, was, was very much still on my mind, as I think it was on everyone's. We were looking at, you know, big cases in the news, but also everyone was looking back on that first boss or the high school teacher, et cetera. Um, and the, really the only way I have to process anything in my life is writing. Um, I don't, I, I don't even manage to go to therapy. It's terrible, I really <laughs> should. Um, but it just kind of all goes in there. Um, and, and in a way that I think is productive for me personally, but that also is productive for the manuscript. But this was, you know, this continues to be a moment when God, we're just unearthing everything. You know, we're looking back on our own pasts, on pasts of celebrities, people we thought we knew, and, and partly going, that was not okay. And then also going, well, that though, some people think that wasn't okay, but I, is it, was it the same thing? I'm not sure. And, you know, the, we, in the public sphere, it's not often, uh, I'm like, there's sometimes, you know, certain cases where I go, I don't know, but I'm not gonna say that on what used to be Twitter, right? Um, <laughs> but I can, I can examine that and ask all my very contradictory questions within fiction. Thank you. Yeah. Very good. I know, I know, I really enjoy Also pro therapy. <laughs> I also love therapy. <laughs> um, so, hi, I work at an intersectional feminist bookstore in Norfolk. Ooh, and, oh. yes. um, awesome. and a question we get a lot of times is how to ethically consume a true crime because of all the reasons that you, know, you guys talked about here. So my question for you is what are some of the things that you look for specifically mm -hmm. when you seek out a true crime book yeah. or a podcast mm -hmm. or a documentary, whatever the case may be, just some kind of tips for like what to look for when you want to consume that type of media and how to keep it. And that's a great okay. question. Yeah, that's that love is it. Great I mean, I think about those questions constantly yeah. because I'm all I'm. It's my professional purview to consume yeah. true crime as much as possible. And frankly, there's a lot of dreck. And unfortunately, that's not going to go away. If anything, it's going to increase because of commercial concerns, of peop, uh, certain entertainment companies really prioritizing the development of IP and the mm -hmm. fact that true crime is IP is actually pretty horrible. So my own things that I look for generally come down to, if, it, if it's slanted towards investigative journalism and rigorous reporting, if I know there's fact checking, if I know that the reporters have really taken care to you know, 
not just ambush a source, but talk to them. There was a book that came out earlier this year by Roxana Askarian called We Were Once a Family, which is nominally a oh, true yeah. crime book, but really about child removal. And she describes how she spent a full year with one potential source just being with him, and maybe he was gonna get ready to talk, but then he backed out. And she had to spend all of that time before he was comfortable talking about his yeah. siblings who had been removed and then uh, subsequently killed with their adoptive family, because that's the time it takes. And the thing about doing work in the genre is you can't half-ass it, you can't do it quickly. There is this pressure to produce things really, really fast but the best of it actually requires a lot of slow thought and rumination and careful consideration. Mm -hmm. So if I am privy to work that has all that, it's generally gonna be pretty good. And if it's not, if I can sort of detect that there's sloppiness and carelessness, then it's not gonna be as good. Yeah. yeah, there's also, you know, things written by people who were intimately affected by it, memoir, right, is, tends to be yeah. maybe a safer yeah. area. And then there's always fiction. Yeah. yeah. I was gonna say, I was gonna say, here's a short answer for you, which is get Rebecca's and recommend Rebecca's book on the fiction side and get Sarah's um, Evidence of Things Seen on the other side. And I have, uh, I have questions for you. And, um, and also, I would recommend um, reading Sarah's column in the New York Times book review. So I, I would definitely recommend that. Um, I think we have time for one more question. We, but stick around just in case. It's quick. <laughs> yeah. We yeah. <laughs> you uh, have two minutes. I also had a question about ethics in true crime. It can be exploitative of women, people of color, the LGBTQ plus community. Both of your work engages with these critiques. As an author, how do you tread that fine line of discussing issues within the criminal justice system, but also within the true crime fan base and not fall prey to yeah. mistakes yourself? Yeah, that's, that's something I, it was you know, constantly on my mind with this is like, well, you know, for even just, you know, if I, cryptic, if I don't give this a neat and tidy ending, it's, there aren't real people I'm talking about, but is it like replicating a kind of injustice? Or, you know, I want to look, I want to examine why we're obsessed with this one kind of case, but in examining that, am I also obsessing about it? Um, it's hard. I mean, I think, I think the best thing that I can do is to contradict myself and to, you know, to, to cast not, you know, not to put the, the blinders on and just look at that thing, but to, to ask openly why we're looking at it, to, to uh, introduce my own analysis and confusion into the book. And just to quickly also follow up, like I think a lot about moral culpability and responsibility, and these are questions that frankly torment me as I work on whatever project I'm on. Yeah. It really came up, I think, when I was working on my first book, The Real Lolita, because a central question was, what do we do about fiction that transforms other people's trauma and pain into art? And what is the responsibility that particularly a novelist has with respect to real life material? But in doing that and writing about a kidnapping of an 11 year old girl named Sally Horner, I was also doing a lot of the same stuff. So I had to kind of interrogate it, not just in terms of what Vladimir Nabokov was doing with Lolita, but also what I was doing with my own version yeah. of Sally Horner based on whatever scraps of material that I could come up with and whoever I was able to track down who knew her, but ultimately I was just doing a reconstruction. So I think as long as we remain aware of our foibles and faults and know that we're going to make mistakes and learn from yeah. them, if anything, I've become more sensitized as I've worked on crime reporting in my books and the anthologies that I've edited. I think that's a good thing, and I never want to become too desensitized. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you so much to the audience. Um, thank you. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I think. If I just can we, do, can we do one more? Oh, they're saying we can do one more. Okay. Really oh, yay. I'm so um, excited. I'm just curious what you all think about the impact of. I know that, Sarah, you said true crime has always been fascinating for folks, but I feel like now that there are 100,000 podcasts and documentaries yeah. and all these things, what you think the implication is for kind of our society more generally. You talked mm. about folks having more questions about the, about the yeah. you know, the, how police, 
can do their job, how well they can do their job. I've also read pieces about people saying that we listen to so many true crime podcasts and now we're all more suspicious of each other. Yeah. Everyone is a little bit convinced they're going to get murdered at all times. And so I'm just curious what you guys think about the how this genre, yeah. how this kind of piece of our culture has impacted the yeah. rest of our culture. We'll give really short answers. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, no, I mean, I think one thing, it just, you know, we don't want to, we sh can't lose sight of the fact that most violence is perpetrated by someone the victim knows, that it's often someone in the home, especially when a child is involved. We can't get into that 1980s thinking of stranger danger that we used to have. And yeah, the world is not actually quite as dangerous as, as true crime would make you think, but maybe it can teach us some things about the kind of people to avoid, you know, the kind of relationships to avoid. That's good, too. <laughs> I think one thing that has been good about this proliferation of podcasts is it does foster a lot of community, but the downside of that is that the community can kind of, you know, the snake eating its own tail, and that the kind of fear that is engendered by concentrating on outsized, of, like, extraordinary cases gets away from the actual like, horrific mundanity, as Rebecca yeah. mentioned, of intimate partner violence and those closest to us that we're essentially, we're looking for bigger issues, but really we have to concentrate on who's closest to us and how that danger is from within. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Angie. Yay. So I wanted to remind everyone that um, to please buy books from Politics and Prose, they are on sale. And Rebecca Mackay, I have some questions for you, and Sarah Wyman, Evidence of Things Seen, are going to be signing at 11 o'clock, 30 minutes from now. So please come by, say hi to them, and buy their books. Thanks. Thank you.